Okay, now we're recording. <laughs> For everyone just tuning in, we, um, we've just done the first few <laughs> scholars of the um, Ninth Remedy Master um, without recording. And all my beautiful introductions and all the rest of it, we, we missed. So, um, Bruce, we'll re we're going to return to this play in a second. Let me just do a very quick overview for the um the viewers who are not going to be here but i'm going to watch this anyway we're doing the ninth remedy master today um we start with the cover which is just the um, fourth master defense against the ninth remedy master um well it's the fourth master defense but against a low attack um and this is against the the sotano attack and it's got a bunch of scholars of course incumbent in it the first two are the disarm and the, uh, the the finish to the disarm once you disarm the dagger you can throw it away you can do lots of things with it or you can immediately reattack. the next two scholars following the the disarm are two ways of getting into the lower key the strong lower key which we see from the third remedy master classically in folio 14 rc okay so we've looked at the cover of the ninth remedy master we've looked at the disarm and, the, and the, the finish of the disarm, and we've looked at two ways to get into a strong lower key. And now we're on the fifth scholar. I do apologize for forgetting to record. Um, hopefully uh, that doesn't happen again. All right. <laughs> so thank you, Bruce, for, for reading the text for us. Um, I have not left my master's grapple and immediately entered under the opponent's right arm to dislocate it, regardless of whether he's wearing armor. Okay, so this one is um, difficult to train and it confuses students a lot. Um, so let's pause on it for a bit. So the first words that Fiore says here are important. I have not left my master's grapple. So we read this to mean that his hands have not changed at all from the moment of the cover. So what we have here we see them we see the master's cover here we see the master's cover here so how the hell does it get here well this is a great example of a an arm break which comes from a push through pressure if someone tries to stab you quite immoderately okay very strongly when you and you make this cover and you feel that energy pressing in on you, you can let that energy continue. And you're going to let that energy continue, and by and large, the energy is going, the arm is going to rise a bit. Now you have you have control over it, so you can guide it up a little bit, but the energy is not going to like go down towards your knees or your you know your leg, whatever. It's generally going to go um, up a bit generally or at least at least you know waist height here so what you're going to do here is you're going to you know you've already gained registration for that arm and because of the way we covered it there's a little um because of the way we covered it here there's going to be a little space between this foot here and the center line right because we typically cover the dagger a little off to the left towards the opponent's right side Okay, so once this once you've covered the dagger and it continues on, you know you're safe from it. And what it allows you to do is basically bring the dagger to your chest and then slam your arm right at the right point of their elbow as it passes you by. And using the force of your core, um, achieve a break. So this this has to be done very carefully in class, but um, it's a it's a very effective uh, it's a very effective play. The, it's also very similar, in fact. I think it's I personally I think it's almost identical to the first master of uh, sort of to the third remedy master that begins the PD. And I know we haven't looked at the PD very much, but for the sake of understanding this play, I want to look at it a bit. So. The third remedy master in the PD. Um, yeah, I think it's this one I want to talk about. 
yeah so here we have the we have the the actual remedy master which is showing a disarm but what we have here is we have the remedy master is slamming his um his armpit into that straight uh that straight arm with force enough to break this could this could be a fantastic break and then additionally there's a disarm incumbent in it okay but the motion is essentially the same this is the same thing except the break is being done on the to the outside of your arm so your your arm isn't over uh his, his arm such that you can um you know such that the contact point is your 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 armpit um this is more the contact points more usually your elbow or the the end of your um your your bicep but it can be a very devastating play if timed properly okay um, additionally, we should understand that this scholar is in third master territory. So even if he didn't get a break, he has all the third master plays incumbent, um, in his position. And this guy looks like he is not having fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so a great play best done though, against someone who's pushing through. Otherwise, um, there's, uh, otherwise it's fairly easy to counter. And the guy's not going to let you get all the way over there anyway, if you're not uh, pushing through. And not if he has any sense. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to the next one. Ah, okay. We've got to deal with the, ne the next two as a group. So uh, now we come to probably one of the funnest plays in Fury. Uh, people love this one. People love the... Uh, <laughs> The poison poleaxe play. But this is a this is a close second in my mind to the poison the poison pole, poleaxe play. Um, this is one of the plays in Fury that makes the most people go uh -huh! um, because it's truly bizarre. And uh, the <laughs> the affectionate name it has in Emma is the treatment. Why it has that name I do not know. That is lost in the annals of history. Uh, maybe one of the uh, older guys uh, knows why. But here we have in the ninth remedy master, we have folio 18 VA, which is showing this play uh, without a leg pickup. <laughs> and we have this play right next, folio 18 VB, and it's showing this play with a leg pickup. So what the hell is it? What are we looking at? Let's read. Can we have uh, Connor read the text here, please, for both? Since I saw that grip, as he bent dagger towards the grip, immediately. Oh, uh, sorry, Connor, your um, your voice is um, kind of breaking in and out there a bit. Okay, maybe somebody. Okay, so, yeah, sorry. I guess the um, the connection must be a little spotty at the moment. Um, we'll go. We'll come back to you, Connor. Uh, Graham, would you like to take this one? Sure. Um... I did not let go of my master's grapple since I saw that the opponent was not relinquishing his grip. As he bent with his dagger towards the ground, I immediately grabbed his hand, uh, grabbed his hand with my left hand from between his legs. Then, after I had his hand in his secure grip, I passed behind him. As you can see, he can't disentangle himself without falling. I can also do the play as you see next. I let go of his dagger with my right hand and grab him to make him fall. At which point, I'll also take his dagger. And that play, which is next. Uh, the student before me has started the action, and I finish it by making my opponent fall just like he said. Although it is not usual to commit to this point, sorry, to come to this point in the art, I wanted I wanted to show this play as evidence of the completeness of my knowledge. <laughs> ah, oh, I see, Fiore. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get what's going on here. We're flexing. All right, we're, we're flexing for Niccolo. All right, here. <laughs> so, what the hell is this? All right. So, first of all, let's start at the end. I <laughs> I wanted to show this play as evidence of the completeness of my knowledge. Okay? So, before we freak out about the practicality of this play or what the hell we're dealing with here, this is important context for us. 
All right. Although it is not usual to come to this point in the art, I wanted to show that I'm a uh, I'm a know-it-all. Okay, cool. Thanks, Fury. So this is a this is a neat little one here that he's tossed into us for our edification. Okay, cool. So um, seriously though, how is he saying it works? So he actually gives us rather explicit instructions here, which is which is nice, uh, g given that it's a strange uh, a strange play. As so after the cover. As the enemy bent his dagger towards the ground, I immediately grabbed his hand with my left hand from between his legs. And then after that, I had his hand in a secure grip. I passed behind him. So, what? Okay. So, um, this provides us actually a little bit of an interesting uh, vehicle to refresh our memory on something important. Once you make the cover, then, you know, there's three possible energies, stay, push through, or pull back. The likely energy against somebody who knows what they're doing is is going to be a pullback, unless there's pain compliance, which often causes stays. But even then, pain compliance can cause pullbacks as well, so there's that, right? The dagger person's um, trying to murder you, and you making the cover is inhibiting their uh, their, uh, their desires. So pulling the dagger back, breaking the grip, and reapplying the dagger is going to bring their murder dreams, uh, uh, make their murder dreams come true. Especially if they add their offhand to break your grip, which is the stand, um, uh, even more standard, I think, than elbow pushes. Adding the offhand to break the grip of the defender and then reapply the dagger once you're in distance is the standard uh, dagger person MO. Uh, as far as I understand. However, once they make the defense, the dagger person er, and the dagger person is pulling back, they can generally speaking pull back to, well, one of the four quadrants, couldn't they? They could pull back high to the right, they could pull back high to the left, they could pull back low to the right or low to the left. Okay? Um, and so where they pull back you're going to follow them, right? Now, generally speaking, in the overhand grip, pulling back to the opposite side of the body is a little more viable, right? Because because of the elbow, uh, the elbow can bend, all right? The elbow can bend with the point still online towards the enemy, right? The point still matters in the enemy. However, once the dagger has been engaged, pulling back to the opposite side of the body offers your whole left side, right? Like you're literally pulling, or sorry, your whole right side. As the dagger person, you're literally, you're almost giving them your back, right? So immediately as a tactical uh, consideration, running that dagger as far away from them as possible, which would be over to your left side here isn't necessarily the brightest idea, right? Even though it might intuitively seem like, you know, the farthest away from their hands is the best place to, to bring the dagger, right? Um, so usually what you see with pullbacks is you see pullbacks to the same side, right? You see an offhand entry, pull back to the same side, either to the high right quadrant or to the low right quadrant. Okay. Um, and, um, and this is standard. This makes sense. And this is um, why most of the plays we've been looking at, especially a lot of the keys are all on the right side, right? This is where the play tends to go and make no mistake. It's not where the defender is pushing the arm. It's where the arm is going anyway. Right? But what if the arm doesn't go to the right side? What if it doesn't pull back to the right side? Well, what do we do? Well, in the case of the high right side, we already know. Pullbacks to the high right side we've seen in the third Remedy Master. Um, of the, I want the Getty, though. <laughs> So if he pulls back to the high to the high right side, we can get things like the clothesline. 
right? We could also get, um, you know, um, we could also get elbow pushes. Um, we can we, we can get other things, okay? But we've, we, we, we've looked at this concept before in the third remedy master, okay? But what about if he pulls to the, um, if he pulls down to the lower left, the lower left, okay? If he pulls down to the lower left, why would anybody do this? Who the hell knows, right? Who the hell knows? But he could, right? He could pull to the lower left. If he were to pull to the lower left, whether or not he's got a Sotano grip or a, a, a nice pick grip, you can try and do the treatment. And so what happens is you're going to follow him to the lower left with your hands on his dagger. And as that dagger crosses the center line, you're going to follow it and try and um, keep it between his legs, between his two legs. And having followed it in, you're going to be very close to his legs. And this actually allows you to reach around his right leg, his lead leg, and grab the dagger from behind. Once you've grabbed the dagger from behind with your left hand, you can let go of your right hand, shift your footwork, and grab it from behind with your right hand. And then you can either disarm it, um, transition directly to uh, frontale, which is my favorite. I'd love to do this on somebody someday, by the way. If there's any volunteers, please let me know. Uh, transition directly to frontale with the, with the hand, uh, disarm the dagger, or um, get a leg pickup. And the defender ends up looking very silly and ridiculous. And that's how this play is done. Um, for, for fun, sometimes we do it in class. Um, it's not something that we do too often because it's not really important um, per se, but uh, it's a it's a it's a good one. Fury threw it in for our edification, and isn't that interesting? Any questions about that one? Uh, no, I have not ever seen it done uh, at full sp or like in a in a fencing match or anything like that in a in a in a fight. I don't think I've ever seen anybody pull this off, but that's because <laughs> that's because no Emma student would be caught dead pulling pulling the dagger down to the lower left quadrant because it just doesn't make any sense. But hey, we got to fight who we're fighting, right? Um, anybody who's been in a larger tournament with lots of people who they never train with knows that you see an infinite number of weird things that you never thought you'd see. Um, which, by the way, Bruce. Uh, shows you how destructive cells are, um, or cells can be to uh, uh, fighting men. But anyways, moving on. <laughs> so the treatment, the treatment's a fun one. Um, it's it's great. It's also a party pleaser. Um, all right, moving on. Aaron, would you like comments from scholars on the ninth remedy master? Um, how many do we have left? Uh, well, since you clearly have one, yes, please, uh, BD. <laughs> so what? what <laughs> so uh, keeping it brief, uh, a couple of brief comments. Uh, <clears throat> the Satani is the the longest attack. You can get the widest range on it, but it's also weaker than the descending blows. You've got to kick out your hips a bit on defending. Nobody likes to get stabbed in the in the nethers. The uh, yes, the block is easier, and the cover. Is easier, and then once you can grab the wrist, then you can do many other things. The fifth scholar, where you keep both hands on uh, the wrist and you turn and grab, uh, our provost does that in a particularly devastating way, uh, really aggressively pulling uh, the elbow in, so that you, if you're not careful, you're, you're going to get a sharp wrap on your on your elbow as he does the play on you in class. Uh, not complaining. I'm just saying that's how he does it. It's, it can be pretty brutal. Oh, you never complain, right? And Beauty? I never complain. Right, that's right. And then, uh, yeah, the the treatment is a particular brag play where <laughs> if somebody pulls back, then you might be able to push it down between the legs and step behind. But you'd have to be really in control of the situation yeah. in order to do that. I'd also like to add that in the cases where we have the beautiful chaos of the uh, multiple person dagger boats where we might have up to 10 or 15 people in Guelph all with a dagger or even half of us with a dagger and half without a dagger then yeah you have to keep you have to keep to the simplest things possible in order to 
<clears throat> try to stay till the end. So just a few of my two cents on the Ninth Remedy Master. Thank you, BD. Uh, Connor and Andrew, do you have anything to add um, uh, thus far? Fourth and No, I really have nothing to add. I heard you very briefly, Connor, but again, you you cut out, unfortunately. Um, um maybe type it out. We'll, just... uh, if you type it out, um, we'll we'll do the, the the last few, and then we'll um, maybe that'll give you a chance to type it out, and then we'll get to your uh, your comment. Um, uh, if that's uh, if that's okay, Connor. Um, okay. So let's um let's press on to the end. We're almost there. And then we'll um, stop and uh, take in the scenery again. So, the eighth scholar. The eighth scholar, 18 VC. Um, I'll read this one. I made the parry of my master and immediately grabbed his hand with my left hand as shown. I'll then put a thrust to his chest with my dagger. And if my dagger is not enough, I will perform the play that follows. So note that this is actually a dagger on dagger play, as it were, or rather, actually, that's kind of a lie. He so my understanding of this play is that the the cover is still done as show. So he's got a dagger. OK, he hasn't been able to take it out to perform the eighth remedy master. He's got a dagger. He's made the cover. Once he's made the cover, he's just smoothly transitioned his hand back to his dagger. He's drawn it, and then he's attacked himself. And the whole time, he's got this nice check on the dagger. And he's not afraid whatsoever. He knows exactly where it is. If that often were to come in, he'd stab it first and then continue stabbing. Very, uh, uh, very simple. And if that's not enough, I'll perform the play that follows. Okay, so let's look at the play that follows. The Ninth Scholar. I am finishing the play of the previous student. I'm leaving my bad dagger and want your good one. Go tell him what I'm doing to you. <laughs> um, and even tell him the only doesn't know what the hell this uh, this means, which is funny. So um, understandably, this, this play is called the bad dagger play. In... Um, uh, at Emma Toronto, and we have a we have a, a wonderful colloquial story about this play, where um, a, a former free scholar of ours, uh, well, I mean he's still a free scholar, of course, he's just not around anymore. Uh, 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 Frank, um, oh geez, what is what was what's his last name? Oh my God! Wow, now I feel awful. What's Frank's last name? Is anybody is anybody here from Emma Toronto? No way. Oh geez. Was he Frank the Tank? Yeah, for, he's a he's a huge, huge guy, big guy. Um, uh, and and very famously, he used to do this a lot in um in, in fighting when people would bring out a dagger, or he he wouldn't carry a dagger because he would want to use yours. That <laughs> that that was that was his thing. So in this play, this person has a dagger. And he's made the cover, but he's dropped his dagger and disarmed this guy's to use this guy's dagger to kill him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is what's going on. Why is this going on like this? What, what's the context? You know, again, who knows? It's possible that um, the situation is such that this defender... Only, not only was he confident of the disarm, but he only wanted there to be one dagger in play. So he tossed the he, he tossed his, um, you know, a, a disarmed this guy's and is going to use this dagger to kill him. In uh, Abrazare, when there's daggers on hips, daggers get drawn a lot. Hips get touched a lot in Abrazare. So daggers on hips is, you know, um, inviting disaster in our bazaar, right? So this isn't as crazy as you might think. It's not necessarily as flexy as you might think. Um, sometimes it can be important. Uh, and also remember armor as well, right? You're in armor, maybe you've lost your dagger, 
or maybe um you know somebody's come in with his and you know you know you have yours on your hip but you know you don't want to handle it um you don't want to handle wrestling around with his dagger while having yours in your hip ready for him to take if he loses his. So you get rid of yours and then take take his. Either way, it's pretty badass. And um, it's the play that Fiori kind of leaves us with. It's the last, formally speaking, the last play of the section. So, uh, question. So yes. it's li- you're just literally dropping your dagger and then returning to the cover and disarm. Uh, I mean... Yes, technically, though I don't think it would be a case of, say, dropping your dagger on the floor here. I think it would be a case of throwing it into the crowd and hitting the lady that's watching. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, just (laughs) tossing it outside of the engagement range. You know, someone someone is going to get hit in the back of the head with the rondelles of your dagger. Douche! (laughs) You don't want that in. You, You don't want it near. Um, although of course, you know, who am I kidding? Maybe you do, right? The context of these is always, uh, always hidden. Um, but why would you toss it? Because you want to use his and you don't want him to have a chance to use yours. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. How is this different from the, um, from the second scholar or the first and second scholar because isn't isn't he just taking the other person's dagger and stabbing him yes sir right you are it's just yeah is it any different um no <laughs> it's just you have a dagger and you're choosing not to use it <laughs> or you have a dagger and you're choosing to get rid of it and use his instead yeah yeah interesting yeah thanks and he says bad dagger um the word for it is um I want I want to find that word the bad uh, bad dagger. I'm leaving my oh, bad no. dagger. Um, oh, oh shit! Well, dag, dagger kept. Captiva. Is, is that it? La sua dagger captiva, and a vole la tua bona. I'm leaving my bad dagger. See, whenever I look at this play, I think it's the eighth <laughs> remedy master, and you blocked with your dagger, and then grabbed his wrist and tossed the dagger you just sure. blocked with. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Why not? Right? Why not? And I mean, we've already said that with the defenses against the dagger, with a dagger, we always have our abrazari to do. So we can always resort to that if we want. If we decide the situation merits it, why not? So absolutely, BD. That's totally uh, viable. Okay, and so last but not least, we have the counter, which is hidden in the last bit of text in the Ninth Master. Um, Alex, would you like to read this one? The counter to the Ninth Master is this. When the opponent grabs you, your dagger hand, the right, with his left, grab your dagger near the point and give it a pull or pull it against you until the opponent loses his hold or give him a thrust in the elbow to unsettle him. Okay. So the counter is to drum roll, double up, (laughs) grab your dagger near the point and give it a pull or pull it against you until the opponent loses hold or give him a thrust of the elbow to unsettle him. So what you would expect the counter is to double up on the dagger and use it as a lever to break his grip and then reapply it. Simple. And not shocking. Or elbow push. Like or elbow push. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, okay. And so that's um, that's it. That's the ninth Remedy Master. Um, I'm not really sure there's much more to say about it. Um, yeah. That we haven't already said. Um, so does anybody have any last questions about the ninth Remedy Master? Disarm and a finish, two lower keys, a nice arm break, a fun set of plays called the treatment, and um, a, uh, a fun uh, a defense and stab with our own dagger, and a disarm, uh, again, like the first master, or the first scholar, a disarm, but tossing our dagger aside too, and the counter. 
that's it. Um, okay, so, wow. Is that really all nine Remedy Masters of Dagger that we got through? Oh boy, what a journey it's been. Um, so that concludes our that that concludes our journey through the uh, through the dagger section of the Getty. Um, it's been quite a wild ride. Um, I think I think I'll make my final concluding comments pretty brief. In that we began the section coming hot off the Abrazari section. We proved to ourselves time and again that we are doing Abrazare in the dagger section, right? Um, we've taken note of the interesting contexts that the dagger adds to our Abrazare, but um, it doesn't change it fundamentally. Most of the dagger section is us trying to do our Abrazare projects with our Abrazare posta, looking for those disarms, breaks, keys, and throws. Though there were a lot of plays in the dagger, if you just take a second and breathe, and think about it, there's really not that much. There's just disarms, keys, uh, uh, breaks, keys, and throws, and they all kind of make sense where they fit. You know, th this isn't an arbitrary set of moves that can be done at any time in any place. There's only cert a, a few, a select few things that can be done in a select few places, and they all are defined by, principally anyway, defined by the energies that you find yourself. Uh, uh, with when you're there. So it's a lot, but it's not, I think. Every time I look at it, it seems smaller to me. Um, the, the the later plays, uh, or at least, you know, the 7th, 8th, and the ninth, they don't have that ma uh, that many in them. Um, the You know, the 4th doesn't have that many, but we're repeating plays constantly, right? We're repeating plays, we're repeating concepts constantly, even concepts from the grappling section, right? Um yeah, the dagger, yeah, uh, the dagger puts quick end to cruel combat, and it demands a full uh, understanding of your own audacia, and a full commitment to um, to the timing of, of actions. When it's your time to move, you have to be there a thousand percent. If you're not, you'll die, and that's the kind of timing and commitment that is going to give us success with the longer weapons. But it's not necessarily as obvious with the longer weapons so we we need dagger to help us uh, help us see that and um yeah so isn't that isn't that neat it's been quite a ride does anybody have any last questions or comments about the dagger section uh connor can we try you again see how the how the line is sure but all i want let's Okay, so all I heard, <laughs> I heard all I want is blank. So I all I want all you want is your two front teeth. Nothing. Oh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <Not that. laughs> uh, you, you know that nursery rhyme? All, all I want for Christmas is my, is my two front teeth. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm sorry the line is bad, Connor. Uh, I I do I do apologize. Um, hopefully it'll be um clearer next time. Um, all right. It's probably. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, we still have some time, so let's let's move on. All right, let's move on. Um, let's take a, a leap into the um, great unknown. So the next, very next section we have is the um, dagger and sword section. Um, so this is another one that I view as a um, transitionary section. Similar to the baston cello and to the um, dagger and spear and clubs plays, although this is less obvious. But anyway, um, and so what we're what we're seeing here is we're seeing the dagger applied against a long weapon. The short um, the short weapon, well at least initially anyway, we're going to see the dagger applied um, against a long weapon, and then we're going to see the sword applied against the dagger, a short weapon. But um, it is through the dagger and sword section that we actually get our first entry into um, swordsmanship. 
and from a very interesting and perhaps counterintuitive place too. So this section is extremely important uh, and, and interesting to us. Um, and it's oft overlooked, I think. I know I, I uh, often um, uh, I, I often keep rediscovering it because I haven't looked at it in so long. So we got some really cool stuff in here and some really interesting principles and, and things. Um, so uh, yeah, let's um, let's launch into it. So let's look at the first master. First master of the sword, uh, the dagger against the sword. Okay, what the hell is going on here? Um, let's have uh, Alex, would you like to read the text for us? Here begins sword against dagger. The advantage is great if you know what you are doing. Here the master waits and his guard called Dent the Dishingado. Whether it's against cuts or thrusts, I'll know how to be safe. I'll pass back with my right foot as I parry. I now close, play by heart, and can't fail. Come on, attack me, one by one. If you don't run away, I'll mess you up with a turn of the body. <laughs> oh, okay, wow. So, lots of words, all right? Folio 19 RA. So let's take this one by one a bit. Here begins the plays of the sword against the dagger. Okay, great. The advantage is great if you know what you're doing. What? What the fuck are you smoking? The advantage? The advantage of having a dagger against a sword? Well, that's counterintuitive. I guess we're going to have to... We're gonna, I guess we're going to learn something. The advantage? Weird. And here the master waits in this guard called Dente di Cingato. With this guard called Dente di Cingato, what guard called Dente di Cingato? We don't know any guard called Dente di Cingato. Where is this guard from? Right? Whether it's against cuts or thrusts, I'll know how to be safe. I'll pass back with my right foot as I parry. What? Pass back? Since when are we passing back? So this is crazy right off the bat, right? This is crazy counterintuitive. I'll pass back with my right foot as I parry. But I know the close play by heart, and I can't fail. Come on, attack me one by one. Ah, the code. Come on, attack me one by one. And if you don't run away, I'll mess you up with a turn of the body. Whew. Wow. All right. So, first of all, the advantage is great if you know what you're doing. What the hell does this mean? Well, surely it must mean that if we make our cover... we have a good chance to do something good. Okay? Surely this does not mean that having a dagger against a long weapon is pre is preferable. Right? That seems patently false. But, if you know what you're doing, you can achieve a great advantage in this particular engagement. Right? And we're going to see that with... Um, 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 when we look at the cover, okay, which is going to come just next. So let's hold this in our minds here, right? That this situation looks pretty bad for the dagger person. It looks bad, but maybe it's not as bad as it seems, okay? Secondly, um, here we um, here the master waits in this guard called Dente di Cingato. This is a guard, um, Boar's Tooth. We're going to see this. Um, this probably mean uh, is referencing the a guard from the sword. Um, otherwise, if the, if this isn't uh, referencing the Dente di Cingato of the sword, he just has a dagger in hand. Otherwise, this is some free random guard that Fiori's dropped in out of nowhere. But here's a dagger guard called Dente di Cingato, and here's the dagger, and it's refused, and here's where it is. Oh, also, this is the first time we're seeing refused posta. Um, but we're going to talk more about this when we get to the sword section. We're going to talk about what this refuse position really means. So hold, um, that's a teaser for later. So, okay, so um, it's not so bad since we know what we're doing. The master waits in Dente di Cingaro. Whether it's against cuts or thrusts, he'll be fine. And he's going to pass back with his right foot as he parries. Okay, so... Let's look at the next play, keeping that in our minds. Okay? Boom. 
There's the next play. Uh, Beatty, which, uh, sorry, uh, Andrew, would you like to read the text for us here? 19RB. Here is the parry my master performs against a thrust. Then he strikes the opponent's face or chest. You always want to be in close play when you fight a sword with your dagger. Now I am in close, and I can easily strike you. Like it or not, you will receive a hit. All right. So we've got here. So this looks great, right? This looks significantly different than the play we were just looking at, right? The previous master, we it looked like we were in deep shit, right? We looked like we were in trouble. But now all of a sudden, it looks like the sword guy is in deep trouble. Because not only do we have registration on his main sword hand, but we have a dagger that's going to come off this sword, look at his split, and it's going to start stitching the guy up like a, um, like a new coat. So, um, how the hell did we get here? So, first of all, the secret lies in the footwork. And this seems very counterintuitive. And in a way it is, because Fiore's footwork is very often in, 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 in. Right? Or at least that's what it seems like. But here, here's Fiore showing a lot of subtlety. Okay? And in order to understand the subtlety, we have to reflect on the context just a little bit. Long weapon versus short weapon, right? The fact is that a long weapon versus short weapon, the um, the long weapon has a great advantage because the long weapon can threaten the uh, the short and can force the short weapon to move without a significant commitment from the long weapon, right? Um, oftentimes, without a significant commitment from the long weapon. And um, the long weapon also, um, well, it, there's more space between, you know, between the, uh, uh, you know, your targets and your opponent than, than the reverse. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the long weapon has a natural advantage against the short, all right? And so we see in, in knowing this position and knowing the situation, we see the master waiting for the attack. And he's also waiting in a very provocative position, which is what this refused position is. As opposed, these guys are not refused. Fury is refused. Okay, it's, which is a you get there with a what we call a volta stabile of your feet. Okay, so he's offering his right shoulder basically to to either be thrust. He's offering his right side, his right shoulder, to either be thrust or um, to be cut. When the cut comes. Um, he's going to pass backwards with his right foot. And keep in mind, this is his right foot. His lead foot is his right foot here. Okay. So he's going to be passing back with this right foot. And he's going to be finding the, the sword with this dagger. Okay, remember the daggers are about the size of your forearm. Okay, so Fiori is going to be uh, picking up the thrust, which is actually pretty easy. The, the, the thrust, this should be no problem. Coming across and picking the thrust up um, should be pretty pretty easy. The cut's a little more dodgy. Because cuts can be strong, right? What he's going to do is he's going to find the sword with his dagger. He's going to pick it up on the blade. And he's going to complete his pass back. As soon as he completes his pass back, he's going to increase forward. Immediately. As soon as that foot touches the ground, it's going to increase forward immediately. Almost as if there was a massive spring on this foot. So it's going to pass back and then boom! The whole His whole structure is going to increase forward. And this is going to allow him to go from re registration on the sword to registration on the hand as well. On the initial cover, he's not going to have registration of the hand. And the reason why we pass back is to increase the, the, the time we have to find the sword. If we didn't pass back, it's likely that we would not have enough time to find the blade. And not only that, but by passing back, 
we take the provocated targets further away from the enemy and we encourage the enemy to chase the targets if the enemy was smart and knew what they were doing they wouldn't chase the targets and they would be very conservative in their motion here because the only way the dagger is going to get in on the swordsman is if the swordsman is um, more excessive in their motion than they should be there's no reason why the swordsman should lose this engagement but by offering the swordsman a, an easy target and by taking it away at the last minute and by tempting them to chase it even excellent swordsmen can think those situations are tasty and worth chasing and i know that because uh, not that i'm an excellent swordsman but you know i've done that myself i've seen everyone uh i've seen everyone do that a time and again so uh, it's not like you know once you know how to fence you're immune to these wiles right you're not especially if you're fighting the blood is up you want to you, know, you want to kill your enemy blah 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 you wouldn't necessarily pass this target up so what you're doing here is you're passing you're offering some targets passing back with the lead foot then immediately increasing forward once you've picked up that sword on your dagger and then gaining registration of the main sword hand once you've gained that registration you can stitch him right the hell up and there's very little he can do the best thing that this swordsman can do right now is to drop the sword and um, do his dagger defenses or you know um yeah like this guy he's gonna you know this is similar to um it's kind of similar to the fifth master in a way although he's not, he doesn't have a collar grab he's got his arm is suppressed which is actually a disaster he needs to clear this suppression but the sword is no longer really useful here so he's gonna have to result in some uh and some dagger defenses to get out of this problem but that's what we got here so long story short Right at the beginning of this sword versus dagger section, we see the sword. Uh, we see the dagger person turn completely around. A situation which at first seems pretty hopeless, seems pretty dodgy. So isn't that awesome? Um, now, however, <laughs> things don't always go as we plan, <laughs> and uh, this play can be countered. And so, um, so here we have a counter, which is actually fairly deep in the play. We have 19 RC. Oh, I guess we should read the text first. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just too excited. Okay. Uh, BD, would you like to read the text here? If the opponent in the previous picture had known how to defend, he would have placed his left hand behind the student's elbow, turning him as shown. I wouldn't have had to do the counter to the master who stands in guard with his dagger. All right. So if the guy who just died before me knew, knew what he was doing, he would have done this. <laughs> so shocker, right? We have an elbow push as a counter. Okay. Insofar as that's concerned, pretty boring, pretty conventional. But what elbow has he pushed? He's pushed the left one. The left one. So that means that this dagger person passed back, gained registration, increased forward, and then grabbed the arm, the main hand of the dagger. And still, the swordsman was able to insert his hand underneath his main right hand and wipe off that, uh, in, that, um, check that, that engagement before it was too significantly set anyway in the act of wiping it off he's also isolated the dagger which is a real piss off for this guy and he's also um, likely put himself in a position to get a strike in there so this is a pretty sweet um, sweet counter for those of you who are skeptical as to how easy or practical this is um i also didn't really understand these cross center line wipes until i spent some time some more time with um uh the uh, zerger academy 
and uh, Jeet Kune Do. And also a bit with um, oh, oh, uh, seeing it with uh, how the Windshine guys do it as well. There's lots of cross center line wipes that, that you can do that are amazing. And even just with a little bit of footwork, they're not really contortionist at all. You know, they if they seem like you're crossing yourself significantly, you're not. It's just really subtle. And so this is what this guy's doing. He has, in fact, wiped off a hand on his right arm with his left. And in order to do that, he's had to cross the center line a little bit. But it's perfectly possible. It's um, fairly simple to do. And it's great. All right? So the dagger person has gone from triumph to defeat in just one play. They just got countered, and now they're dead. Or likely dead. <laughs> All right, um, but we have another play, 19RD. 19RD. Um, Connor, would you like to, uh, shoot the stupid sound. Uh, Graham, would you like to read this one? Sure. If the master standing in guard with the dagger is attacked with a fedente to the head, he should pass forward quickly, execute this parry, turn the opponent by pushing his elbow, and then he can strike him. He can also bind the opponent's sword with his arm, as you can see in the fourth play of the sword in one hand. You can also see the middle bind in the third play of dagger, where the bind is a hand's breadth from the face. All right, so lots of things in here, actually. Um, if the master standing in guard with the dagger is attacked with a fendente to the head, he should pass forward, not pass back, and quickly do this parry. So this is this is very interesting. This is another way to approach it, although Fiori is specific about what sword blow to do this against. He says a fendente. Okay? So he says, um, yeah, basically, very simply, if we, um, if, if you're in this position, the position of the, uh, the, of the master that we started, if you get a clear fendente, right, an attack straight down the middle at 12 o'clock, pass forward, find the dagger in this way, immediately go for that elbow, push the elbow, reapply the dagger. Okay? You could also, depending on the engagement, you could also get the middle bind, which he likes to repeat very often. He's very fond of the middle bind, as we know. And he also talks about a play from the sword in one hand section. So let's look at that. He talks about the fourth play of the sword in one hand. Wouldn't it be nice if he just used his own folio numbers? <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be hilarious? Okay. So the fourth play of the sword in one hand. One, two, three, four. Is it this one? No, it's this one. It's this one. One, two, three, four. It's this one. Fourth scholar. So, which is a middle bind. Which is a middle bind. So, um, let's look back at this play. Uh, here. So, what he's actually doing here is he's not actually bleeding the, the, the force over to his right side. He's actually catching it on the quillins. Oh, he's going to catch the fendente on the quillins of the dagger. Which is one of the reasons why the rondels. I'm sorry, the rondels of the dagger. Which is one of the functional reasons why they're so uh, great. They're so big. They, it's true they keep the hand there. Um, that is true. But they also allow you to engage longer weapons, especially longer blades. And so he's caught the dagger. He's um, he's he's engaged the dagger, of course, on the blade. But this sword is going to grind out on the rondels. If he's inside this swordsman's position. He has the middle keys available. If he's outside his uh, the arm, he has the elbow push with the reapplication of the dagger. And uh, regardless, once he's inside and he has registration of the arm, the sword becomes um, next to useless. And this guy's going to have to make some really hard decisions about what to do with it the rest of his time, which likely would involve dropping the sword, in my view. Okay? Um, from the uh, Folio 20 VD, 
um, the fourth scholar of the um, Master of the Sword in one hand, we have this similar situation. Here we have this middle key. This is going to become a middle key with a little uh, tuta volta from the uh, scholar. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, isn't that neat? 19 RD. And that's that's all of the dagger versus sword plays there are, per se. Okay? So, effectively, we have two covers against cuts and against thrusts broadly. We have this pass back play where we pass back gain registration on the on the, the sword, increase immediately gain registration on the main sword hand, then we can take the dagger off and reapply it to their body. We have a counter from the swordsman, so we know that um, the dagger person's not, uh, he doesn't wholly have the advantage. The counter is intuitive and it's perfectly possible. And then finally, we have this uh, cover specifically against a fendente. You can pass forward and get yourself either into a bunch of middle keys or a nice elbow push. So isn't that neat? Okay. It's at least a framework and uh, for um, how we can think about dealing with the longer weapon with the shorter it's conceivably uh, or it's perfectly conceivable to extrapolate uh, what we're looking at here against the uh, spear um, and to some degree uh, i'm not sure to what degree though <laughs> against the polax um, and against um, against uh, an opponent on a horseback i would just try and throw the dagger into the eye of the horse that's 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 what I would do. Um, yeah. All right. So, but the, the the next half of the play, or the the next half of the play, the next half of the section switches it up, and now we have a sword in our hand. Finally, and we're starting with this this second master um, of this uh, section, 19 VA, and here we have the someone with sword dealing with someone with the dagger in a position that looks curiously like the fifth master, the fifth remedy master of dagger. But he's got a sword in his hand and it's got his sword in LaDonna, um, what we will know soon to be post LaDonna, um, or it's very similar to post LaDonna. So uh, what happens? Let's see. Folio 19 VA. Um, Alex, would you like to read the text for us? This is a situation of dagger against sword. The dagger man holds the swordsman by the collar and says, I'll strike you with my dagger before you even pull your weapon from the sheath. But the swordsman replies, go ahead and attack. I am ready for you. As the dagger man attacks, the swordsman performs the following play. <laughs> all right, cool. So very important information here. First of all, um, well, we're defending with a sword, right? Second of all, this is a collar grab. And the dagger person says, ha ha, I've got you. But he says, I can kill you even before you pull your weapon from the sheath. So we know that this sword is in a sheath. And that's the situation we're dealing with. Okay. So why is the sword in the sheath? Right. Well, again, there could be many contexts for why a sword could be in a sheath. There could be many contexts on a battlefield as to why you might be holding a sword in a sheath and someone come up, comes up and gives you a collar grab. There could also be civilian contexts and where you might be walking around with a sword in, in a sheath and someone, you know, and you, you come up in, in the, to the situation in a, in a civilian context. So, again, we're left to speculate and the context... Uh, the particular context may uh, motivate us to take this situation in one direction or another, okay? But the main takeaway for us for now is that these plays, and these plays, the sword is formally in a sheath. So, what do we do? 19 VB. 19 VB. Uh, 
Andrew, would you like to read this one for us? When the dagger man lifts his arm to strike me, I immediately place my sheath over his dagger arm to keep trouble away. I quickly unsheath my sword and can strike him before he can even touch me with his weapon. I could also take his dagger from his hand using the first master of dagger or put him in a middle bind using the third play of first remedy master of dagger. All right. Awesome. So now we're flexing our knowledge. Now we actually have a, you know, we're starting to get a significant amount of, uh, of technical material behind us. Okay. So first of all, um, the defense with the sheath. So this defense is friggin' awesome. I love it. It's, it's super cool. Um, from that position in kind of LaDonna, you can put the sheath right against their elbow and holding the sheath, draw it, draw your sword and strike him. And that dagger can't reach you. Now you may ask, doesn't that suppose the sheath is in some way robust? It's not some sort of floppy clothy sheath. Um, yes, I think so. It needs to have some kind of robustness to it, either a robust spine uh, uh, to it on both ends, or the whole thing is, you know, made of some stern material. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't do this. But, as it would happen, uh, even if you didn't have a robust sheath, you could do other plays, right? And just because you're carrying a sword doesn't mean that you haven't read the whole rest of the book so far. And from the rest of the, from the, from what of the book we've read so far, we know that against Fendentes, Menderitos, we can do first master stuff. So we have the first master defense, we have the disarm, and we have the middle bind. So all of that's available to us. Just be, and just because we're carrying a sword doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything. We can still do it. Once we've dealt with the dagger, and you know, if we still have the sword, great. If we if we don't, um, once we've dealt with the dagger, maybe we get a chance to pick it back up. And if we have the sheath, uh, then if we have a robust sheath, then fantastic. We don't even need to care. So isn't that neat? Moving on to the next one. 19 VC. Uh, BD. This is another situation of sword against dagger. The swordsman holds his Battery weapon low. with the point on the ground is pictured and says to the other who's holding him by the collar, go ahead and attack with your dagger. As you attack, I'll throw my sword over your arm, unsheath it while passing back with my right foot, and strike you with my sword before you can do so with your dagger. Wow, all right. So, this is another situation. So, the other, um, the other who is holding him by the collar, right? We already, we already saw this one, right? Although, I think that might have to do with, that might mean the next one. Uh, whoops, where where are we? Here we are. Let me just uh, skip to the next one. Yeah, it is. That's referring to the next one. Okay, so he's talking about the next two images coming up. As you attack, I'll slam my sword over your arm, unsheath my weapon while passing back with my right foot, and strike you before my sword, uh, or um, w with my sword before you do the same to me with your dagger. Okay? So... Remember this position, because this is going to look very similar to the um, main master of the sword in one hand. But here we're looking at 19 BC, and we might as well um, look at this one as well. Okay, and 19 BD. I'll read this one. The situation is similar to the one just before, although the action is not the same. This play is done in a similar way to, that, um, uh, to the one before, which is the dagger man lifts his arm to strike... I lift my sword up under his dagger, putting the point of the sheath in his face, and passing back with my front foot, I can therefore strike him as you see next. And then the finish will be after. So, uh, okay, so we'll do this one, and then we'll do the next two. And it'll be pretty easy. So, 19 VC, so what's going on here? So, um, here we have a collar grab, and we have a situation similar to the fifth Remedy Master, where we have this arm, we have the dagger, it's in our presence, but we don't have registration of it. What are we going to do? So, in this case, when the dagger comes and it's in a nice pick grip, 
this um, the swordsman is actually going to bring the sword up under the dagger, you know, in a similar way as if you were doing a, a defense against the dagger with your arm. He's going to come up under it, but then he's going to shift it to his right side. Because he has extremely significant leverage over this dagger hand with a robust sheath. He's going to shift it over to his right side, and he's going to gain almost effective isolation. And once he's got once he's got the the, the dagger in uh, something of a third remedy master position, he's going to unsheath his sword and continue. This is a little hard to describe, um, but not on the floor. If we were on the floor, it would be super easy to to show. But suffice to say that he's going to be engaging the sword the dagger directly from underneath. And then shifting to bring this uh, to to bring the dagger towards the enemy's left side. So he's kind of really windshield wipering this whole business, clearing the center. Okay. And this this is this is also a great action because you don't necessarily have to care too much what blow he throws. You could throw him, you know, any, you know. A kind of mandrito or up to fendente, and you're going to catch it with your long weapon. Okay. So cool, great. Um, the the next is there a question? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yep. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm a bit confused. So the second master, we have the master, then the first scholar. Yep. And then here, the whole motion is just described in, in the master itself. Like yeah. I. Yeah, with, that's that, that's right. Why, like, why is that the case if, if the situation seems so similar? Well, why didn't he provide a scholar? Uh, no, I guess, like, why did he have a single defense move for the second master broken up between the master and the first scholar? Because the actual master doesn't seem to be doing anything uh, in uh, the situation. Okay, well, so let's remember... Okay, so um, that's actually a good question. So let's re re remember what we're looking at here. So the original... The original master here, the second master. This is the third master. The second master has the sword on the on the shoulder, and he's coming in. He's coming in to engage from above on the elbow. Whereas here, he's not engaging from above on the elbow. He's engaging from below, and he's going to engage at the forearm. Okay, so the action is different. Oh, no, I, I agree that the actions yeah. are different. I'm just saying that both the second master and the mm -hmm. third master are defenses with a sheathed sword against a dagger and a collar grab. However, right. in the second uh, master, there are two images for a single defensive action. Right. In the third master, there's just a single image. The, the, he doesn't like make a, a first scholar or the third master to describe him doing the motion. Correct. And in the next <laughs> master, there is there are two. So I think we should write a letter and and ask him how dare he. Yeah, I, I guess I was, just, I... I was just curious what, what that uh, <laughs> might mean. No, I don't know. Your your guess is as good as mine, man. Honestly, uh, um, I, I, I don't know um, why he doesn't follow this up with a scholar. Um, I don't know why he finishes plays that uh, like he provides finishing uh, uh, finishes to plays arbitrarily um you know it's um it's a good question i i, I don't know i don't know why he didn't get, uh, give a scholar to, the, uh, to this guy uh, but he did give one to this one so i guess it's a mystery yeah I, I i have no idea i don't have a good answer for you did you have a a, a suggestion bd or andrew so I was just going to suggest we look at the Pisani Dasi for comparison, but it's very similar. It is similar. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, you know, not good, but you know, there it is, right? So I, I did warn you. I, I should I should uh, uh, reprise this. I did warn you last session that the organization of the book and Fury following his own rules was going to decrease significantly as we get through the sword section. Um, so we're going to see things. This is far from the only problem we're going to see uh, uh, g heading into the sword and two hand section. So um, it's a good, interesting piece of data to keep in our minds. Right. 
Um, you know, one of the this, this isn't a very strong argument, but you know, in lieu of any of any other piece of data or any other stronger argument, it seems likely that the counters that Fiore the counters that you know, or rather the um the the finishes and the scholars that follow after plays that Fiore does show the ones that he he decides to show us he he probably shows us for a specific reason what that reason is we don't know but it's clear that in some cases he just doesn't think that showing us a scholar is gonna you know it, well it's not here where is it it's not here why does it why is it not here who knows you know maybe it has something to do with the 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 academic scholarship uh manuscript family history of, of this project maybe it has something to do with his per uh, Fiore's personal choices and this this not being here this the scholar for this this master is uh, an accurate uh representation of Fiore's desires you know who who knows but um what we can see are the facts and the facts are that there is uh there's no there's no scholar for this one in the Getty anyway uh, but there is for the next one so let's look at these uh, these next ones both, and I'll I'll read I'll read these ones. Um, so our um, our last reader already read this, but I'll read it again. This situation is similar to the one just before, but the action is not the same. The play is done in a similar way, in that the dagger man lifts his arm to strike, or as the dagger man lifts his arm to strike, I will lift my sword up under his dagger, and put the point of my sheath in his face, and pass back with my front foot, and I'll strike him as you see next. Um, so here we go. In a similar way, again, this dagger is going to come up. As soon as the dagger comes up, the swordsman is going to reach out and gain registration on that dagger hand underneath. But they're aiming to have BB point on with the end of the sheath to the face of the enemy. And in the very next play, we see here, this is the play of the master who, who is in the situation we just saw. I'm doing exactly what he said. So he's unsheathed the sheath, which is slammed into the opponent's eye. He's got the cover already because the sheath is robust. And as soon as um, that, uh, as soon as he draws his sword, he can uh, use it. And as long as he, as long as he um, keeps a hand on his robust sheath, then he can keep control of the dagger hand. So all in all, against a dagger, as a swordsman with a robust sheath, we have a defense from above, and we have several defenses from below. All Sorry, with a similar I, theme. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't quite follow. How exactly do you keep control of the dagger hand in uh, this in this case? Right. So imagine imagine the sheath. So you know, if if the sheath is robust, if it's like if it's solid, right? If it's wood, um, if it's you know, leather with, you know, metal sides to it or something, right? If it's, you know, if it's a robust structure unto itself, right? Then if you put this underneath the dagger uh, hand and you you hold you hold it, then it's going to suffice as at least some kind of structural check on the dagger hand. And but all here you're, you're keeping it at their face, though. Well, in this case, yeah, you, you're gaining registration on the attack, and then you're 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 stabbing them in the face with their you're you're slamming them in the face with your sheath, while you draw your sword and step back. But how can you simultaneously slam them, slam them in the face with your sheath while having registration on the dagger arm with your sheath? Um, you can. <laughs> uh, this may be one of those things that you have to take my word for. Um, before we uh, we get onto the floor, um, but uh, you can. That's just how this how this works here. Um, it should be noted that you're 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 also you're not necessarily defending the dagger with this, like you're not trying necessarily taking the full brunt of the blow uh, with with these actions. Fury uh, is saying, I I think the language is that you're achieving registration on the dagger when it rises up. You know, so you're not necessarily trying to you know, defend it like you would in the sixth master or something like that, right? But once you achieve registration with this, you can 
uh, and you're holding your robust sheath, it can effectively act as a at least a check, right? And in this situation, your principal uh, goal is to step back and draw your sword. So the fact that it's it's operating as a check is sufficient, right? And this play is great because it's even got some pain compliance incumbent in it, right? This play doesn't have pain compliance incumbent in it, but it's still fantastic, still good. This play also doesn't have pain compliance in it necessarily, although you can get a face shot with this one as well. You're just going to have to take my word for that. Um, once you've once you've brought it all the way over, you can get a face shot from underneath. Um, but uh, with the sheath. But yeah, it's a cool thing. Um, it's something you wouldn't necessarily think of doing with your sheath. Um, but um, but it's neat. It's a it's a neat play. Um, yeah, I'm not sure much uh, what more I can say on that. Um, so since this is the end of the section, um, let's open it up to general questions and last comments uh, from the scholars. So we'll take last comments from the scholars first. Um, Andrew, Beatty, um, and uh, uh, Connor, please um, <laughs> embroider me your questions and send them by mail so I may make sure I get them somehow <laughs> i'm sorry for the terrible uh volume uh issues today uh okay uh bd comments so i pull with david murphy and he says even if you don't take your sword out of the the sheath mm -hmm. you basically defend with it and then beat the crap out of them yeah that's another good point <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the first uh, cover when you come down onto the elbow feels a lot like the um, part of the first play of wrestling mm -hmm. where you're covering the inside of the elbow with your left hand. Yes. You're just extending out your arm to do it. The second cover when you're coming underneath feels like the unusual cover from Mandrita where you come up with your left hand to bore his tooth from the outside. Uh, wh which cover is that again? The... Uh, <clears throat> The rising from the outside with the sword down yeah. in behind mm -hmm. their uh, their wrist. Yeah. And that feels like the Mandrita block where you come with your left hand to the outside of their arm up to Boar's tooth. And then you give them the, the body shot or the, oh, the kidney see, shot. I see what you mean. Interesting. I've never, I've never thought about it that way. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are uh, these are neat. I must say, uh, once you do these, you feel a lot. You, you feel pretty predatory as the dagger person against someone with a sword. I think, or at least you do. You do more than y you you did before. You feel like you maybe have a shot, and then you do these, and you feel humble again. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'd rather have a sword. Thanks. Where's my sword? Please give me a sword. Because these covers are all great. Um, they're very. I'd say they're high high confidence level covers. Um. Uh, Andrew, do you have any last comments about this uh, this section? No, not really, but I do like practicing these plays, and they're nice to know. Yeah, they're very much fun. One more comment. Mm -hmm. um, this is like the fifth Remedy Master of Dagger. If for some reason they grabbed you with their left hand on the other side of your sword, then you just go after their arm. Yeah, sure, sure. Why not, right? And th see, that's a great, that's a great um, uh, a point, BD. Because uh, again, you know, we're we're not, we're trying to see the spirit of the art behind the unfortunately limited medium that is this book, right? And uh, you know, once we once we have a feeling, once we have the the taste, once we have the the sense of what Fury is getting at, we can start to intelligently branch out uh, what we already know into situations which haven't necessarily been fully described. And what Beattie said I, I, there, I think, is exactly uh, is exactly accurate. If that arm is across the center line, you know, if, you're, if your sword is more sort of to the outside of his arm, why wouldn't, you know, why not use it to gain isolation? Use it as a great, you know, a great lever, bar that arm, maybe even break it. Who knows what you could do with it? So, yeah. Now we're thinking like a fighter. Um, okay, so um, last but definitely not least, um, today we finished off the dagger section. 
amazingly. And we moved on to the, uh, we did the whole um, uh, dagger against sword section. Uh, we had some uh, recording issues at the beginning, but I hope that um, wasn't too bad. We probably only missed 10 minutes or so, and or, or, or maybe less. Mostly it was just my starting boring speech. Um, so I don't think anybody missed much. Um, the dagger versus sword section, in my view, is another transitionary section between main topics, I guess. Um, if one considers the sword, the dagger, and wrestling the main topics, um, at least in the first half of the book. Um, so we've moved from dagger to a dagger and sword. We've seen things we saw before, and we've got some hints and flavors of things we're about to see. Um, the next section we're going to tackle is the sword in one hand section. We'll probably stay. There's a lot of stuff we have to talk about with the sword, so we're probably going to stay on this all uh, all next time. Um, but we've already seen um, seen some hints of things uh, that are going to come up in that in that section. But I want to spoil it, so I won't say too much more. Um, this is another one that doesn't get practiced very often, not least because you need sheaths um, to do this to, to do this stuff. But, um, I, you know, the stuff that we have done of this with the sheets and the dagger man and whatever, this is all, this has seemed very flavorful to me. I, I get a, I get a good, like, I get a good, um, you know, whiff of the, of a, of a civilian context doing these sorts of plays and some, t in a way that sometimes I don't get with the more traditional dagger stuff. So I really like these. They're very flavorful. Um, and yeah, the great to practice. So, um, if no one has any further questions or um, uh, comments about anything we've looked at today, then um, we'll call it a night. Anybody have anything else? No? Okay. So, um, thank you guys very much, as always, for uh, joining me. Um, this will be uh, put up online shortly, I'm sure. All of you um, be safe and healthy and your families as well, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, Aaron. See you guys later.